welcome to the show our guest Jonathan Lane. Welcome, Jonathan. Hey guys, you've been you have such close ties. Even though your site is very balanced with reporting all the different Star Trek fan films that are out there, and you, and you really try to give coverage of everything that's going on, which I imagine is overwhelming sometimes because there's still a lot of productions. You decided that you want to create your own Star Trek fan film that is set in the Axonar universe that called Interlude, right? Yes. But <laughs> but how is that going? How is that going? Uh, yeah, and, and, and to answer your question before I hit Interlude really quickly, um, it is overwhelming. And, and you know what? I don't – I haven't covered every single Star Trek fan film out there. There's still a lot – that I want to cover. Uh, I actually have three blogs written um, that are histories of things in various states of of completion. Um, I'm, I'm currently working on one, uh, a blog about uh, the German stop motion um, crossroads and the beginning of the end that was done by uh, Jürgen Kaiser. Uh, I think like, well, the first one was done like 10 years ago and the second one was done in 2016. Uh, it's all in German, but it's fantastic. He literally did stop motion with, you know, action figures uh, and miniaturized sets. You know, I've got oh, a blog. I love things like that. You know, I've got a blog ready that's half ready. I haven't finished writing it yet because it gets, gets so busy. Uh, and I've got my next blog. You know, I did a three-part history of, of Star Trek Intrepid where I was interviewing Nick Cook from Scotland. And then my um, next one, I promised Michael King to cover Star Trek Valiant, Starship Valiant. Uh, because that was... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Enough. He does good stuff, sure. So, you know, I've got all this stuff planned. I've got I've got interviews with two guys named Greg, uh, audio recordings uh, that, I, that I've done. I've edited through the interview with Greg Teft of Constar Chronicles, and uh, I've got one coming up with Greg Mitchell. Why am I interviewing the two Gregs? Because Vance Major, who is the creator of Constar Chronicles, said, you know, stop putting the spotlight on me already you know there's some great people involved with this mm-hmm. interview them uh so i did so i'm basically going to have you know a tale of two gregs and it's going to be like you know one and two part thing and it's going to be two audio interviews with these guys so this is all stuff that's like literally piled up waiting to go um uh i've got a a, a, a blog for later on this week with uh randy landers explaining the new starship alexander from potemkin pictures and he gave me a bunch of so Overwhelming, yeah, but you know what? Good it's people, fun. good, and and that's and that's a you know moving a studio is not an easy task. Yeah, so you know, and that Randy Landers just moved his studio from Alabama, where he lived in his home, uh, to Lexington, Kentucky, where his new home is, and so now all the Potemkin Pictures uh, folks that want to use the bridge have to travel to Lexington, which is about six hours from Alabama where they used to be. But they're planning on doing it because they love doing which it, which is awesome. Absolutely, sure. And this was my own segue into Interlude because I'll tell you something. For four years, I've been covering these Star Trek fan films on my blog. And even longer, you know, if we count the Axnar years. And I'm still doing fan film prize for uh, for Axnar's website, axnar.com. But the one thing I hadn't done, I've been involved in fan films since then. Uh, Mark Largent and I co-wrote and co-produced uh, a parody of this of Axanar and the long on the lawsuit called Prelude to Axed We Are, where all the characters are animated puppets. Oh, that was great! Yes, yeah, love that one. We wrote that yes. one in a weekend, and I, I was reading his part of the script in McDonald's, and I was choking on my chicken McNuggets. It was so funny. Um, and I did one of the voices. I did two of the voices. No, I did three of the voices. I did I did the Master Snowball, and I did the uh, two, um, the two Paramount uh, or pair of mounts, uh, Chicago Blues Brothers, you know, guys who were saying, you know, this is infringement. And uh, and I did uh, Darn the uh, the the Unforgivable or un- whatever it was, uh, the the Klingon there and. Yeah, so I, I, I voiced over that one. Uh, Mark Nacaredo, who's doing the Romulan War, asked me to supply one of his voiceovers for one of his war stories shorts. Um, this is called First Flight. You know, look, go, go to Fan Film Factor, type up First Flight in the search, mm-hmm. and you'll find it. But, you know, I so I've yeah, still... Yeah, good stuff. I've sure. been part of these fan films, but the one thing I hadn't done it was an itch I just wanted to scratch was to actually be the executive producer and the showrunner of my own Star Trek fan film. And I had written, I'd rather I had rewritten 
the Axinar script, after Alec had the settlement with CBS, after a year in court, they never actually even got to court. It was all just, you know, the posturing beforehand. Uh, the two of them settled. And CBS and Paramount, after spending about a million dollars on this lawsuit, said, okay, you can make Axanar. You can only make it as two 15-minute fan films, though. And you can't publicly crowdfund it. And he's so far been obeying that. And by the way, if you want to give money to help complete Axanar, even though Alec can't say he's publicly crowdfunding it, he can privately crowdfund it. So I'm going to let you folks know that if you wanted to donate a little to help Axanar be made, he is crowdfunding. It's just private behind a firewall. Go to Ares Digital, A-R-E-S Digital, dot Axanar, dot com. And if you go to AriesDigital.axonar.com, you will be asked to create an account, and you will become a member of the Axonar fan community. You'll be on the mailing list, and then Axonar can solicit money from you. But that is a much different thing than having a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo where you just go up there and give money. Um, so Alec can't talk about that publicly, but I can because I never signed an agreement. And so anyway, at the end of all of this, Alec had to take his 90-minute fan film and squeeze it down to two 15-minute fan films. And the obvious solution to that was to just take it from being a dramatic feature-length film and to make it in that same mock documentary style as Prelude to Axnar, where it's sort of like a History Channel documentary. And I was looking forward to reading what Alec had rewritten and seeing how Axnar was going to be. This was 2017. It was June. And I read Alex's script, and I will be honest with you, it was troubling to me. It was not as good as I hoped it would be. One of the things I noticed was missing from it was any scenes on, on the Ares Bridge. And I thought to myself, you've just spent one hundred dollars or $200,000 starting to build a bridge set. How could you not have the bridge in there? Now, I didn't say this to Alec initially, but as I was writing up my notes for it, my notes were, they were long. And the first thing I said is, show, don't tell. And I realized that I needed to do that. I needed to show Alec what I was talking about. And I created a scene on the bridge to add to it. I took this one throwaway line that was explaining why Admiral Ramirez was not going to appear in the next two Axanar films. And that was because actor Tony Todd didn't want to continue with the project. So Ramirez is gone, but why? And it was just a throwaway line of Ramirez was wounded and he had to sit out the rest of the war. And I took that. Totally makes sense. Totally does. But I took that and I expanded that into this sneak attack by these Klingon D-7 cruisers just as they entered the war as Ares and another ship are transporting in a convoy Ramirez back from a secret meeting and the Klingons are on top of them and they are bashing these two ships with within an inch of their life and Ramirez is hit, he's wounded he's taken to sickbay, he is dying and he needs the, he needs surgery right now but the ship is shaking you know, like an Etch-A-Sketch and, you know, the, it's, it's getting blasted apart. And so as the two ships are trying to escape, the other commander said, when, 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 when Garth says, Ramirez has been hit, he's in sickbay, the other commander just says, get out of here, Garth, now. And it's this moment of this other captain knows in that, in that exact moment that we can't afford to lose Ramirez and he knows he has to sacrifice his ship. He has to literally turn around and just let his matter-antimatter engines explode and cripple these Klingons so that Ares can escape. And it's an amazing moment. And so by adding that, it's like, okay, now you get a bridge scene. You know, wouldn't this be great? And it could be really, really quick. You know, I didn't see this as being like a 10 or 11 minute fan film or whatever, because Alec only had 15 minutes. But I saw this as being something that could happen in like, you know, 90 seconds if you handled it right. And I had a whole bunch of little scenes there. I moved stuff around and whatever. And I, I submitted the script to Alec and uh, Alec said, thanks, but no thanks. Um, 
you know, <laughs> and I understand that is his script. He can do whatever he wants with it. But I, I had to get it out of me. I literally wrote it in a night. I, I stayed up until four o'clock in the morning. I had 15 pages, went to sleep for like three or four hours, woke up at around nine or 10, started writing at 11. And by four in the afternoon, had written the other 15 pages for part two. And at some point after Axanar is out, I'll share this as a kind of alt Axanar, like, you know, this was just something that John threw together one night when he couldn't sleep because he had too much caffeine. Um, you know, but the thing was that Alec obviously didn't want to use that for his uh, fan film. And instead, Alec ultimately teamed up with Paul Jenkins, who was the man who saved Marvel Comics from bankruptcy during the 1990s uh, by creating the Marvel Knights series. And he wrote Wolverine Origin. Uh, he's done video games. He's done film production and directing very talented man and obviously a good writer and he came on to co-write it so i'm sure that the axonar script looks much better now i actually haven't read it but i know that paul made some changes and i know some of the changes he made because he told me um so axonar is in good hands but meanwhile i have this alt axonar script and i had this really cool opening scene that I loved, I loved the drama of it. To me, this was head canon. canon. This was, this was Garth knowing that he couldn't be like, you know, Kirk always is like, take me, not him. You know, I'm responsible for the lives of my crew. He's ready to sacrifice himself. This is a moment where Garth can't Kirk himself out of this. There is no way they can't beam Ramirez over to the other ship. Ares cannot sacrifice itself. The other ship has to. And it's a bit of survivor's guilt, and it's part of what makes Garth, I think, Garth after the war. And so here I was with this story, and about the same time, a fellow by the name of Trey McElwain had started creating Axanar comics. They're beautiful. And they're beautiful. He had this wonderful artist by the name of Daniel Fu, a high school friend of his who was still friendly with. And... I said, would Daniel be willing to illustrate a short story from me to add to your Axanar Comics collection? And he was willing, and we worked together, and I turned my script into a comic book script, and I created some panel layouts for him, and then he recreated those panel layouts because he's a much better artist than I am. And in some cases, I loved what he did, and in some cases, like, no... Nah, Really, can you do it more this way like I had it before? And he was fine with that. And so anyway, we ended up coming out with an eight-page story, including the cover, of what was, I called at the time, Stardate 2245.1, because that's the, the day that the Klingon D7 enters the war. You know, the very last line of, of Prelude to Axanar is Stardate 2245.1. The D7 enters the war. And that's where it ends. And you see these three D7s coming towards you. And my idea was, that's the first scene of my story. It, it literally is the next moment after Prelude. And we discover who these three Klingons are chasing. They're chasing Garth and that other ship. And so for a while, while we were creating the comic book, it took several months to do this, that was just what I was going to do. I, it wasn't going to be a fan film. But then I was talking to Josh Irwin, who had just released Ghost Ship, which was the first of the Avalon Universe Star Trek fan films. And this is just... Good. Oh, it's, it, yeah, all yeah. this stuff is amazing. And this was just after Axicon 2018. Or, sure. Yeah. But anyway, so the, the bridge had just been revealed to fans, and it looked amazing, and so... The next week I was chatting with Josh and doing a, a, an audio interview with him. And after we finished the audio interview, we started talking about the bridge set. And, and I was asking him, I said, you know, maybe I should record this, you know, the answer to this question, but would you want to shoot any Avalon fan films on that bridge set? Because I know that Alec is going to open it up to uh, other fan films to use. Um, you know, you think, you know, that would be something you'd want to use? And he said, you know, I would love to shoot on that bridge. And then he sort of went off on, you know, all the ways he'd shoot it and the angles and the lighting and everything. And, you know, because Josh is just, that's the world he lives in. He loves cinematography. He loves, 
you know, lighting and camera angles. And he's an absolute director of photography. And uh, so anyway, he gushed and gushed and gushed. I said, so you're, you're going to ask Alec if you can use it? He said, well, the thing is, is we don't really have a story or a script that justifies using it. And I thought for probably less than a half millisecond. And I said, what if you did have a script that called for the bridge? Would you be willing to direct that? And he said, possibly, I need to see the script. And so I sent him my original script and I sent him the comic book script and he liked it. But obviously the original script, which was written, you know, as a fan film, needed to be expanded because it was basically like a 90 second to two minute long scene. It, it had to be expanded. And I had already expanded it a little bit for the comic book. So having taken my script that was a fan film script and turned it into a comic book script, I then proceeded to turn it back into a fan film script and expanded it to, I think, like 12 or 15 pages. We kept talking with, you know, Josh and I together and Alec and eventually brought in Victoria Fox as well, who had been Josh's uh, colleague and cohort on uh, making all the Avalon Universe fan films. Uh, you know, he directed the first oh, one. Oh, yeah, by she's great. Yeah, and she's so personable. These are all good people that are involved. Oh, they are great people. I mean, that's one of the great – that's one of the things about fan films. And, that, and, and, and honestly, I'm so happy that I made the decision to make this fan film. I mean, basically, it was an itch I had to scratch. That's kind of my, my joke. I just I just – had to make it. Uh, my wife sort of wishes that I didn't have to make it because it would be great if I wasn't going through all the hassle of, you know, making an actual fan film, which is very time consuming. Um, but, uh, you know, it was it was a labor of love, obviously. I mean, just to raise the money for it was, you know, a full time job for me, uh, you know, for like three or four months. And, you know, we raised, I think, over twenty thousand dollars for it. And then another five, four thousand because we screwed up the green screen. But that's another story you can check out on Fan Film Factor. Just type in uh, green screen and Paul Jenkins, and you'll find lots of things. Uh, but anyway, we we went forward with Interlude. Um, it's a real production. I have learned so much. I mean, I went in there knowing nothing, Jon Snow, um, and. It's it's the most amazing education I've gotten in such a short amount of time. I mean, not, not that I'm ready to go into Hollywood and say, oh, well, now hire me because I know everything there is about filmmaking. But so many things were done. Many things were done right. Some things were done wrong. Um, some early mistakes have come back to bite us in the butt later on. Um, but on the other hand, other things have turned out amazingly. Uh, as you and I are talking right now, Josh Irwin is putting together uh, a second edit based on my notes to the first edit. So we are now assembling the puzzle pieces. Almost everything is shot. We have the production is almost the production phase is almost all done. We have two more scenes of Garth to shoot. Uh, and these are the older Garth documentary interview scenes uh, where he's wearing the, the Pike era turtleneck. Uh, we are piggybacking that on an Axnar shoot that's happening on March 15th because it's the same shot. They're, they're filming old Garth as well. You know, we didn't film old Garth back in November because he had dyed his hair to look like young Garth. So his hair is, you know, the dye has grown out. His hair is a little more salt and pepper now. And so Paul Jenkins is going to be directing a series of interviews of Garth. And then when those are done, uh, Victoria and Josh are going to step in and then we're going to record a couple of uh, our scenes of Garth. And it's just going to be the same interviews of Garth. It's just, you know, my fan film has these takes and theirs have, has this one. Now, I really give Josh and Victoria credit because they travel a lot for their involvement in fan productions. Oh, my God. And you know what? And I, and I wanted to write a blog about the fact that they like they literally drove through a hurricane and an ice storm. They're amazing. And they told me, they said, don't bother writing that blog. We do this all the time. It's no big deal. I said, it's no big deal for you. I want people to know how dedicated you guys are. Like, it's not dedication. It's just it's our true. job. true. They're hardcore. 
You know, but it's look, it's our job. We do this for a living. I'll I'll drive ten or twenty hours or whatever to go into the middle of nowhere when I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, and I have no cell phone coverage unless I drive five hours back into town. And we we'll, we do this because this is this is our job. And I said, well, great. Except for you, it's normal. But for everybody else, this was like holy crap. And not only that, but remember, the fan film guidelines say you're not allowed to pay people. So basically, Josh and Victoria, in their regular jobs, they get paid to drive 10 or 20 hours, okay? Whereas on Interlude, they're driving 12 hours to Georgia, um, and, you know, the, the guidelines say, I cannot pay people. So, you know, that's that's the way it is. And so for me, the fact that they're driving through an ice storm and tornadoes to get uh, to the sick bay set because, you know, the guy coming in for that was coming in from Cleveland, the fellow playing Ramirez, uh, who's just on a medical bed, you know, but he's he's a big, bald, black guy, you know, muscular and everything. He's, you know, Tony Todd's size. And I've seen the the footage from that. It looks like Ramirez. It's really cool. Uh, and, and and Victoria, you know, she said she dodged hurricanes uh, or not hurricanes. To, 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 Victoria said, you know, she she dodged tornadoes the day before getting all the makeup supplies. Um, he looks so wounded. I mean, you would believe after seeing him that, yeah, he has to sit out the rest of the war. And I actually asked her, I said, make sure that when you put the makeup on him, that you put some like major blood growing, going across his mouth because Ramirez has that scar in Prelude to Axe. Yeah, Star. that's right. Yeah. It's like. This is where he got that scar. And I checked with Alex. Oh, he's like, yeah, cool. fine, whatever. You know, he's not Tony Todd's not going to be back. So, yeah, this you, you get to be the one who puts the scar on Ramirez. Um, but, you know, the, the footage looks amazing. I I can't say enough positive things about Josh and Victoria as filmmakers. And Josh, especially as what he calls painting with light. Um. And it really is. And color and light, what he what he did with this is uncanny. Because the, the, the Aries Bridge is amazing to begin with. The Aries Bridge is just... Yeah, it's awesome. You know, it, it, it's it's 360 degrees. It's, it's built like a truck. You know, I mean, you could crash into... Don't do it. But you could crash into one of the panels and it won't, you know, fall over. Whereas that's not true for any of the other, you know, ones. You know, don't get too close to the panel. Don't lean on it. Um, you know, it's, it's built rock solid and it's totally immersive and the colors and the lights and the digital animations are amazing. So just filming on that bridge alone, it's going to guarantee it's going to look like an amazing fan film or film for that matter. Just like the original Star Trek Enterprise bridge was amazing. You know, you, you, there was, there was no bad way to shoot that bridge, but if you had a director who knew how to shoot that bridge. There were some amazing angles of Kirk and Spock and the whole bridge and the colors, because remember back in the 1960s, color television was just starting out. So Star Trek established that it was a colorful show. You know, now that you've paid all this money for a color television, we're going to give you color. I mean, that's why mm-hmm. Lost in Space had these ridiculous, you know, colored uniforms as well. But at least Star Trek was more tasteful about it. And Josh recreated that. You know, he gave us a Star Trek. You know, Discovery is very blue, and Enterprise was very blue. You know, and Picard is very Earth tones. You know, there's a lot of artsiness right now. This is what classic Trek looks like. Darkened a little bit, because we're in the middle of a battle, which also, I believe, is amazing, because the bridge really does glow with its own light. Um... I actually pissed Josh off at one point because he said he was going to turn all the lights out. And I said, you know, it's a joke. I said, are you not going to be able to see the faces because all the lights are out? Uh, but he took that very personally because he's like, you will be able to see the, the faces um, because they're going to be lit properly. But we're not going to have this overall washing light on. It's going to be the dark, subdued, battle-damaged 
USS Ares, where a lot of the light is coming from the consoles up on the faces. And that's going to create... So he really was painting with light. Uh, I've apologized to him multiple times for, you know, making a joke about saying he won't be able to see the light. Um, But he takes it very, very seriously. But ultimately, I know now exactly why he did, because I see what we came out with. And I can honestly say this is going to be one of the most stunning, visually stunning fan films, I think, that has ever been released. And I'm sure so, so what is the status of it then? And, and, and when can the fans view it? Uh, Tuesday. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I will tell you what the schedule is. I, I, there's nothing for me to hide. Uh, so we have the Alec Peters shoot on um, the 15th of March. And at the same point in time, we're also going to be grabbing uh, our chief engineer of the Artemis in the same way that uh, Paul Jenkins grabbed a chief engineer for Axanar by putting some pipes behind them and putting them in the pit of the bridge, uh, which looks crazy if you see it from a distance, but on camera, the magic of the camera, it looks amazing. Um, So we're going to have the same engineer that we have a person to play the engineer. And then we will have production wrapped. Also, we're going to get John Gill doing uh, a few narrations for us. So we're, we're collecting that. Um, that hasn't been recorded yet because we're trying to massage a little bit of what he says. Um, Victoria has some ideas to make it flow a little bit better at the end, so I'm fine with that. You know, we try to be very collaborative, uh, the three of us together. doesn't always work, but we try. Uh, so we've got that. Visual effects, we have uh, – Lewis Anderson is doing our visual effects. He is uh, not – named Lewis Anderson. He's just using a pseudonym because he doesn't want a bunch of fan filmmakers to all come to him saying, please do my special effects. He's like, no, no, this is a favor for you. And so he's done finals of, I think, eight or nine of our shots. We're going to have probably about 18 or 19 when it's all said and done. Uh, We have previs on all but four more, which means that they are rendered kind of light, um, very, you know, no detail. But at least we have them for timing. So if he gets really busy with his regular job and can't finish them by the time we have to lock in a cut, we'll just insert what we have because that cut is important. Our music guy, Kevin Croxton, who is a Star Trek fan filmmaker himself and also an Emmy winner. Uh, I like to put that in every time. I've got a person who won an Emmy writing my music, but he's amazing. His music is, is incredible. But he he's in Arkansas as well. Everybody's in Arkansas except for me apparently. And um, he teaches fourth and fifth grade music, and he does a fan film every year with his kids, with his fourth and fifth grade music club. And a few years ago, it was uh, The Bunny Incident, and it was filmed at Starbase Studios, Star Trek. Uh, Last year, it was Batman, uh, 1960s Batman. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, Look for that as Batman, The Scheme is Sound. Just go and watch it. It's amazing. This year, he's doing James Bond with his kids. So he's really busy working on that right now. And then after that, he's also going to be scoring, like, I think a six-part documentary series. So that's going to be in chunks. So we have this two-week window of him being able to score our thing without his fan film going on or his documentary. So basically, once we hit April 15th, April 15th, the end of the month, that's Kevin. So we have to have our final cut to him so that he can score it because you don't want to get the score and then suddenly say, Oh, we're going to edit out like three or four seconds over here. No, 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 no. Everything has to be done. So we do need to get all of the footage in there and as many of the special effects done as possible. So if any effects, we still have four effects that haven't even been started yet. Those are the priority right now. So Lewis has to get us previs on those ASAP. But once again, he's very, very busy now for the next, I think he said probably like seven or eight weeks. Uh, So it's going to be close. It's going to be close. He's going to take us into early April, but he said he will be able to hit that April 15th time. So he said, if anything opens up before that, he'll prioritize these things. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Once Kevin finishes scoring it, it gets handed to Mark Edward Lewis, who is going to be doing our sound mixing. He's also going to be editing Axanar. I hope the two of them aren't, 
put on his desk at the same time, but we've kind of reserved him out for beginning of May, and we don't have any big rush at that point, but he's going to do all the sound mixing, which means he's going to add in the pew, 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 pew. Um, he's going to add in the red alert klaxon if we decide for that. He's going to add in all the background noises and the beeps and the buttons. He's going to turn the music up or down when people are talking, make sure everything works together, clean up all the audio. I'm guessing he's done by June. If so, then we could release as early as June 1st. But then Alec wanted to debut Axanar at San Diego Comic-Con. Now, if he's going to debut Axanar, Axanar is only going to be 15 minutes long. That's not a lot of time to spend in a movie theater, you know, or if he has both of them done half an hour long. So the idea is that we'd have Prelude to Axanar being the first 20 minutes, followed probably by Prelude to Axed We Are, just to give everybody a little, you know, fun little bit of something, and then Interlude, and then Axanar Part 4, the Four Years' War Part 4, which is really Axanar Part 3 or Part 2 or whatever it is, <clears throat> basically the first of the Axanar parts of the sequels which is going to be the Four Years' War documentary, part four, because Prelude to Axnor was part three. So Prelude uh, to Axnor, uh, sorry, was, would be part three. Uh, so part four is called The Gathering Storm. So the idea is you'd have 20 minutes of Prelude and then another six minutes of Prelude to Ax We Are, and then you would switch to what's looking like maybe about eight minutes, my fan film might be, eight to ten minutes. It's going to be pretty short. Uh, of that, and you're only like up to like 40 minutes at that point, um, and then either 15 minutes or a half an hour of Axanar. And you're a little over an hour, which is now justifiable to keep people in a movie seat. So hopefully that'll happen at San Diego Comic-Con. If it doesn't, but Alec is thinking, or Paul Jenkins is thinking, you know, we'll have this thing finished by Dragon Con, then I'll come to Georgia. I will hold interlude until Dragon Con. We'll do the same thing there. If it's looking like Axanar is not going to make it, you know, because of crowdfunding, but I'm hoping that everything gets done in time for either San Diego Comic Con, in which case I only have to drive for two hours, uh, or Dragon Con, in which case I have to fly for six hours and find some place to stay in near Atlanta. <laughs> Maybe Alex. Well, well, I mean, we always go to Dragon Con, so it would be great to see it there. Yeah, and well, I mean, I'm sure that if it's shown at San Diego Comic Con, it will also be shown at Dragon Con. I just don't know if I'll necessarily come for the Dragon Con thing because, you know, I just paid to. Yeah, it's farther away for you. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, is, doing a fan film is actually kind of expensive, even though I raised money for it. There's probably about three or four thousand dollars of my money in it, you know, personally. Sure. Including the five hundred dollars I put towards fixing the green, or not fixing, but replacing the green screen. Um. <clears throat> but anyway, that's uh, the very, very short answer <laughs> to your question of what's the status on Interlude. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu, nanu.